Stay tuned because next on Heartland Highways, we're traveling to Sullivan, Illinois to meet Paul Stone, a University of Illinois collector who has everything from souvenir cups to historic pieces. He's got the stories behind the items in his collection, too. Then hop on over for nostalgia at its best as we take you to the small town of Flat Rock, Illinois for their annual frog jumping contest. The episode closes out with a look at historic Danville theater group called the Red Mask Players that has seen actors like Dick Van Dyke and others grace its stage throughout the years. That's coming up next, so don't go away. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by EIU's Academy of Lifelong Learning, providing all community members an outlet for their educational, social, and creative pursuits, opportunities to learn new skills, engage in topics of interest, and explore new areas of learning, available for people of all ages. More information available at 581-5114. Welcome back to Heartland Highways. As is our way on this show, we're always meeting new people, and in this story, there's no exception. Paul Stone of Sullivan, Illinois, has an extensive collection of University of Illinois memorabilia. He also has the stories and history that go with them. Well, the University of Illinois has always been part of my life. My father uh, grew up on a farm uh, during the Depression, and he went up and worked his way through the University of Illinois for his undergraduate degree and his law degree, and he met my mother up there. So uh, that was the start of it, and I remember when I was a boy, come football season, he always had season tickets, and we'd go up to Memorial uh, Stadium, watch the games, and I spent seven years up there, get my accounting degree and then my law degree up there. So and starting with mom and dad through their grandkids or something like 16 or 18 degrees from the University of Illinois. So we have a little orange blood running through us. I have three boys, all of them graduated from Illinois with an undergraduate degree. And then my oldest son got his law degree there like my father and I did. So uh, it continued on. But not your wife? No, she's an Eastern graduate and proud of it. As you notice coming in, the license plate on our car out there is EIU's number one. And that's to keep peace in the family and make collecting this stuff a little easier. What really started was homecoming pens. And I had uh, mine from when I was up there, a few other quote souvenirs. And dad had a few items and uh, then a lot of them came off of e eBay and it just expanded uh, as time went on because it's, um, I, I enjoy the collection because it can often tell you a lot about people, what life was like uh, back in those days, a hundred years ago, and uh, how college students' life is so much different nowadays. The oldest dated piece is an 1876 course catalog for Illinois Industrial University from 1867 when it was founded up through 1895 it was known as Illinois Industrial University and then they started getting too many calls from parents about their kids that they couldn't handle and wanted to know if the industrial school could uh, could take them so they changed their name to the University of Illinois in 1895 and then of course Homecoming pens are, are current up to date. I have over 100 homecoming pens, so there's no particular period. One or two of my favorites are, are right here, this medallion and this football helmet. The 1910 Illinois football team was undefeated and unscored upon. And this is the championship medallion. Uh, Champions uh, 1910, and there are 19 names on it, and that includes the manager, the trainer, and a couple of coaches. Back in those days, the, the players played both ways. So I saw a picture of the, the 1910 team, and there were only about 29 players in the picture. So 
they're probably, and, and this is embossed on the back with their names, there probably weren't 40 or 50 of these made. And this helmet, one of the players, and his name's on here, Dylan, Chester Dillon, and this is Chester's football helmet. Now Chester came along before the uh, NCAA stuck their nose and everything because he played four years at IS Illinois State in Normal and then he came over and played four more years at the uh, University of Illinois. So uh, th this and the helmet are, are two of my favorites because of the rarity. This is a 1910 University of Illinois ROTC uniform. In this one, it's a scrapbook of a uh, lady who went to university uh, 1910 to 1914. And uh, one thing in here that's unusual, this is an armband from the 1913 Illinois homecoming. You have Illinois and the HC for homecoming and the moss have got to it, but again, that's the only one of those I saw. And what's interesting about this album, she also took her own pictures. This is a beanie from the first homecoming game at University of Illinois. And, uh, I still claim that University of Illinois was the, along possibly the Indiana, was the founder of the modern homecoming football tradition. There had been homecomings before that universities had had, but Illinois is one that started it as an annual event. And at the bottom are some uh, various bookcases or uh, bookends, and this is a very heavy set. It's from a forge at the university that they forged these. And the Indian figure here with the two feathers was the original emblem. I have a pen in the other room, show membership in the Illinois Union. And so that would have been the first image of uh, what turned into Chief Alina Weck. One of my other favorites, it's uh, the robe hanging on the end. My father served uh, uh, six years on the Board of Trustees at the University of Illinois and served two years as president of the board. And that is his robe and uh, cap from when he was on there. And one of the higher class items in my collection <clears throat> is the toilet seat. And of course, appropriately, it says, go Illini. And of course, what every Illini fan must have is a lava lamp of the 1970s or 80s. Are you done collecting or are you still? Oh no, I, I'm still collecting, but it's a, a little harder now to find things that I don't have. I don't like to collect a lot of duplicates. Uh, so it's getting harder to find unique pieces that uh, uh, that I don't have. What's the one thing you're still after? Well, the homecoming pins. I'm uh, I have every pin from 1914 through 1976. 1912 is my oldest, so a 1910 homecoming pin would would probably be the one thing now, or a 19. Uh, uh, 11 or 13 homecoming pen. Uh, the other homecoming pens I'm missing are mainly up in the 70s, 80s, early 90s. For our next story, the small town of Flat Rock, Illinois has two claims to fame. The first one is that it has more sidewalks per capita than any other town, and the second one is its annual tradition of a nostalgic frog jumping contest. Take a look. Over a century ago, Mark Twain wrote The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calabasas County. The story tells of a bet made on how far a frog can jump. Frog jumping contests are a storied tradition, and one thing you can bet on is that one small town called Flat Rock is keeping that tradition alive. I heard about the, the frog jumping contest in California that uh, Mark Twain wrote about, so I thought, well, maybe there's something to it, and it's been a real one of our better 
uh, crowd drawers. There's two things that really draw a big crowd, and uh, one's a baby contest, and one, the other one's a frog jumping contest. Pretty well what governs in the frog jumping contest is whether or not they can catch the frogs. Last year it was a dry year, and uh, frogs were hard to catch, and we had 60 some, which was really a low number for us. And uh, but if it's a good year and they can get the frogs, it's not uncommon to get 75 people here with the frogs. The annual Flat Rock Homecoming is where all the fun takes place. The homecoming is a festival started 35 years ago to bring people in the small community back together once a year. Back in 1975, we had a sesquicentennial celebration and folks kind of got together after that and then of course the nation had their bicentennial celebration in 76 and Flat Rock took part of that with a little celebration but then uh, back in 1977 we decided to start an actual you know folks said let's go ahead and keep the festival going and, and do some things and so far it's uh, kept going we, we did miss one year because of lack of help and interest uh, had another group pick it up so even though those numbers don't add up this is our 35th homecoming festival here at Flat Rock. Flat Rock, we're, we're a community of uh, 415 residents. We, uh, we've been here since, well, 1875. Uh, actually, the village of Flat Rock was actually east of town. Uh, was uh, The old post office was set by a large Flat Rock, uh, and that's why they called it Flat Rock. When the railroad came through town in the 1870s, uh, that's when Flat Rock actually moved to where it's present day uh, the village grew, you know, grew up. We were a very large com community mm -hmm. down during the uh, oil boom days. Uh, had a large fire in 1912. Uh, 1912, uh, most of this area you see around you, uh, the park, uh, around the park, the business area, all burnt to the ground. Uh, after that, um, the village of Flat Rock was, uh, they made an ordinance that all buildings had to be built out of brick. And a lot of those buildings are still standing here in the park today. Um, or around the park today. We have uh, the most, now this is our claim to fame nationwide. Uh, it's in, been in a number of brochures, but we are the, uh, uh, have the largest amount of sidewalks per capita of any place in the nation. And that is mainly due to the fact we had all this leftover mortar and all this leftover cement and things like that where they were building up Flat Rock in 1913 and on. And uh, that's why we have so many sidewalks. Perhaps their second claim to fame is the frog jumping contest once deemed the largest east of the Mississippi River. Drawing in hundreds of spectators and dozens of participants and frogs, the free event includes prize money for the winners and is a clear homecoming favorite. No entry fee and uh, no age limit. The adults can get in there if they want to. We'll have sometimes grandma or grandpa carry a pretty little, little one out there. and. Uh, we allow some, some help for the ones that need it. Mom or dad or grandma or grandpa wants to get out there and help them. We allow them to help them. But once they put the frog in the circle, uh, they can't touch it. They can stomp at it, spit on it, whatever they want, which they've done different times, anything to get it to jump. But uh, they can't touch it. We, we put the frog down. Uh, it gets three jumps. One, two, three. And I always try and tell everybody too, uh, we, we don't want any uh, frogs that have been on any kind of uh, steroids or any, we'll, we're, we'll drug test your frog if you bring it here and it's, you know, we think there's something fishy about it. But uh, no, the, most of them are bullfrogs out of local ponds, local, you know, sloughs, local streams, uh, areas. And uh, the kids go out and help their parents catch it. It's kind of a family thing, you know. Uh, and it, there's a lot of competition involved, a lot of pride involved. Um, but uh, just to, to watch the frogs and people cheer them on and the different ways they try and get the frogs to jump, and uh, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's very unique, I'll say that. Some say unique, while others may say absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it's fun to watch, it's, it's uh, funny to watch. It's also scary for some of the participants uh, out there or some of the folks that are out there in the, uh, in the audience watching. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of uh, cheering and clapping and, and even some screams of horror uh, when them frogs take off for the crowd. Frogs occasionally get out in the crowd and, and they get some excitement there too because some people don't like them frogs. We've had them jump up people's pants legs and, and a few things like that that's 
really stirs them up. The frogs come mostly from local farm ponds. JD and Warren say you can usually witness a scramble to catch them the night before the contest. The frogs are then released back into the ponds once the contest is over. Bring your own frog. We don't encourage uh, any frogs uh, uh, being shared. Mainly, I mean, one of the things is, uh, you know, that it wears the frogs out. I mean, we do have a little compassion for the frogs. As a matter of fact, all these frogs are put in a, the frogs that the families don't want to keep. They're all uh, put in a, in a bucket uh, or a drum with water in it, and we take those out and release them into local ponds when the frog jumping contest is over. So we kind of recycle. It's a green thing as well, uh, pardon the pun. <laughs> Win, lose, or draw, the contest remains a favorite for a variety of reasons for those who turn out for it generation after generation. I was a or took part in one of the very first frog jumping contests. I was about 12 years old at the time. There's, uh, of course, my father-in-law, who's run it for a number of years. Uh, he's, he has his grandkids. His kids were in it. His grandkids uh, are in it now. Uh, and then there's a, a Wampler family. Uh, Greg Wampler, i got to bring his name up because he goes out every year, and you ought to see some of the frogs he finds. I swear he's feeding them under his house or something. But, no, there's, uh, there's some day, definitely some competition and, and some other folks from, you know, kind of, I'm not saying we do any side bets on the side or anything, but there is some uh, you know friendly competition going on too, yes. And it's one of those old fashioned type of fun things that there's so much technology out there involved and so many things that are, you know, involve families, you know, or, or people being away from each other. This kind of brings people together, not only families together going out and hunting the frogs, but brings a community together to watch it and, and be entertained by something that's, you know, from years ago. Finally, we spent some time with a group of volunteers who just love community theater. Since 1936, the Red Mask Players of Danville, Illinois, have been entertaining audiences with their live stage productions. With a permanent home that was once a church, the Red Mask Theater is one of the oldest running community theaters in the state. Take a look. It's amazing, year in and year out, I, I do shows here and I, I, I don't think I've ever met anyone that I just didn't get along with. Everybody seems to have the same objective and, and that is to put on a, a quality performance and uh, have a lot of fun while you're doing it. And uh, that's basically what we do. Since 1936, the Red Mask players have been a part of the Danville art scene. It was the vision of founder Catherine Randolph, an educator who wanted to bring live theater to the community. She was an elocution teacher known for coaching the famous William Jennings Bryan. But the Red Mask was her passion, having directed virtually every show for 30 years since its inception. At that time, they were playing in various venues around town. They were playing sometimes at the Masonic Temple sometimes at the old Palace Theater, sometimes at the Fisher, just any place that they could get a stage to perform on. And then in 63, this building came up for sale and Red Mass bought it and uh, it's been home ever since. This building was originally designed and it's an original architecture uh, for the First Presbyterian Church. And there's a cornerstone uh, outside up by the ramp that's kind of covered by the, the new ramp that we just put in. But uh, the building was set in 1901. So we've, the building has been here more than 100 years. Uh, as you look at the building from the outside, uh, you'll see that there's kind of a castle look to it. And, and children, including myself when I was a kid, it was the castle. We wanted to go to the castle. So we're very fortunate to have this facility. And you know, the large ceilings, tall ceilings, and all of that, it just really, it adds a lot to it. Uh, it's a neat old building. Uh, people laughingly say that uh, Catherine inhabits the place and that if you're here late at night working, you'll hear creaks and things, and oh, there's Catherine looking over our shoulder, making sure we're doing it right. We don't have to move scenery around. We have it in the building. We build a set. We don't have to tear it down and move it someplace else. Uh, that's a challenge and it's very difficult to do. So we've got everything right here and it's a luxury not everybody has. And when you walk in that back door, there's a smell to this building. And it's not a bad smell, it's just, it smells like a mixture of sawdust and paint and just theater. 
The Red Mask's rich history is catalogued and preserved in numerous albums and posters in the theater's basement. Newspaper clippings, photographs, programs, and posters showcase the people who've graced the stage and their performances, including Danville natives Dick and Jerry Van Dyke. Today, the Red Mask presents three stage productions per year, as well as two children's programs. Everyone in the theater, from set designers, technicians, costumers, directors, and actors, are volunteers. We have a lot of lawyers, a lot of school teachers, uh, a lot of everyday folks like myself. Uh, just, just from every walk of life, people who uh, always you know, wanted to try their hand at it, but never had the confidence to do it like me. And then all of a sudden, when I stepped on stage for the first time, I, I decided I didn't want to leave the stage. <laughs> I'm a backstage person. I've, I've been on stage a few times. I just don't get the buzz that a lot of them do. It's okay. But I get a thrill out of building a set or, and making sure that everything runs the way it's supposed to. Uh, more often than not, I'm stage manager, producer, or in charge of set construction, that kind of thing. And I, I just enjoy it. Well, there are a lot of theater majors we have that, that work in the building. And some of us are just, we are not trained in, the, in theater. We're just people who pick up on it and love it. And we grow as we, as we get a, do a show or have a part or have a, have a job in the theater. Every show you like to say you have someone new on stage, and we do again, and it's contagious. They're here now, they will continue to be here, they'll take this appreciation, we hope, and, and, and use it other places. A lot of the people on stage have been on stage many times, but we're always trying to get new people to get involved, to come down, and a lot of people are scared, oh, I can't do that, or I'm not any good or anything. But it's, uh, that's the nice thing about community theater. There's something for everybody. In the fall of 2013, The Red Mask performed The Sly Fox, a fast-paced comedy written by Larry Gelbert, creator and producer of MASH. Dave Downing is the show's director. It takes place in the 1800s in San Francisco. And it's about this gentleman who is pretty sly and cunning like a fox. And he is interested mainly in other people's wealth. And there are three men in character in, in particular that he's interested in. Lawyer Craven, uh, Jethro Crouch, and Mr. Truckle. And the three of them are interested in Sly's money, so they are tr trying to do whatever they can to become the sole and only heir of his, because they think he's dying. So that's the premise of the thing. Uh, he's not really dying. He makes believe he's dying. And these guys will do anything to become the main number one guy who gets all of his fortune when he passes away. Certainly I can do better by Sly than some common opportunist. I certainly hope so, yes sir. My catchphrase for this show is faster, louder, and funnier. Those are very important things because the pace has to be very, very quick. And you have to be just as funny as you can possibly be. And you have to be loud. The medallion's the real prize. Come on, little birdie. <laughs> doesn't want to leave the warm nest. <laughs> From casting through final curtain call, the process takes about three months, and then it's time to start over on a new production. The group holds their annual Katie Awards, named in honor of their founder. These awards honor outstanding works by the organization's actors and directors. The fact that it is a community theater, um, we, want, we don't want to be the best group in Danville, we want to be able to further Catherine's dream, is to be able to bring the performing art to the community and to give them the best possible show that they can see and to help them learn about it when they see it. We want them to get involved. And by doing that, you present the best that there is. You help people get, gain an appreciation for it. And the people that uh, come in the door, whether they perform or whether they just simply are a patron and enjoy the performances, they have a deep appreciation for it. And that goes all the way back to 1936. 
If you'd like to purchase a copy of any Heartland Highways program, contact us at 1-877-727-9348 during regular business hours. You can also visit our online store at weiu.net or mail in your order with payment to the address on your screen. DVDs are available for $25 each. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, or American Express are accepted. Just let us know what show you're interested in by mentioning the story name or person featured in the show. Wow, a lot of great stories in this episode, but unfortunately we're out of time. As always, we'll have more for you next time. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you out there on the Heartland Highways, where every mile is an adventure. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by EIU's Academy of Lifelong Learning, providing all community members an outlet for their educational, social, and creative pursuits, opportunities to learn new skills, engage in topics of interest, and explore new areas of learning, available for people of all ages. More information available at 581-5114.